Hello gentlemen, welcome to our first video on chapter 15 called Chemical Equilibrium. Now today, 15.1, we're going to start with the concept of what equilibrium is. Now up until date, we've talked about chemical reactions only happening in one direction, from reactants to products. But that's not actually completely true. Reactions do not always occur in only one direction. In fact, it's actually rare for that to happen. Most reactions are reversible meaning my reactants become products and then my products can collide together to go back to the reactants. We call that chemical equilibrium. So chemical equilibrium is when what occurs when a reaction and its reverse reaction occur at the same rate. So for example, my reactants here collide together to form product and my product collides together to form reactants. This happens over time. So for us, to the naked eye, it appears as though the reaction is stopped. You know, we put two things together, they fizz, they bang, we don't, they've done whatever, they exploded, and then it seems as though nothing else is happening. The reaction is usually then at equilibrium, meaning my reactant is becoming product, product becomes reactant, doesn't look like um, we're just creating product anymore. Because at first, we're just creating reactants with product, 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 but as I accumulate more product, those products start hitting one another, colliding, and going back to my reactants. So I have my forward reaction and my reverse reaction. Now, as a system approaches equilibrium, both the forward and reverse reactions are occurring, as I just said. An illustration of that is here. So my reactant, N2O4, has a higher concentration to begin with, of course, because it's the only thing that's present. As it's going, as it is... Uh, as the reaction is continuing, the rate begins to decrease because I have less and less reactants there. If they're reacting together, they're forming products. So, if I have less reactants colliding, then the rate is going to decrease. And that's my rate law there. And eventually, it will settle out, equal out. Subsequently, the rate of my product being formed, except it's missing here, square value there. The rate is starting from zero because nothing was formed to begin with. Then as it started forming, the rate started to increase, 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 and then it begins to plateau. At this point, they both plateau and they are equal at this point. That means equilibrium has been reached. Once equilibrium, equilibrium has been reached or has been achieved, the concentration of each reactant and product remains constant. Not the same, meaning this is the same as this, but just constant, meaning unchanging. For example, in this diagram here, my uh, reactant started out with a high concentration. This is the N2O4. As it reacted, the concentration decreases because I'm using up a lot of that those reactants in it mellows out, or plateaus there. My concentration of my product, the NO2, started from zero, because I didn't have any concentration yet, because I didn't have any product at first. Once the reaction starts, my concentration builds and then levels off. When both of these level off, at a given point, equilibrium has then been reached. Now, just as we did in chapter 14, we can apply rate laws to this concept. And we can draw rate laws for the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. Now, what's different about this one is the rate law is going to depend on only the stoichiometric coefficients in these um, forward and reverse reactions. Since we're not given any data sets to analyze for equilibrium reactions, um, we cannot assign reaction orders, or we're not going to assign reaction orders, rather. So, my forward reaction, I had N2O4 goes to two moles of NO2. So my rate of the forward reaction is K sub F, my equilibrium constant in the forward direction, times the concentration of N2O4. My exponent here is going to be a 1, because I have one mole of my reactant. So again, my rate law only depends on my reactant involved. 
For my reverse reaction, the two moles of NO2 are now my reactant forming, or going you know, backwards, to the N2O4. My rate law for that is the rate of the reverse reaction equals K sub R times the concentration of NO2 squared. At equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So I can set these two equal to one another as I did here. If I isolate my concentrations and my equilibrium constants and get them on either side of the equation, I get this. Dividing this, K sub F divided by K sub R equals a constant called K sub C. The C just stands for that, stands for concentration. We're talking about the concentrations of different substances at equilibrium. This is at some temperature. Now, the general format when we're talking about writing equilibrium expressions is going to be for reactions like this. We have A plus B goes to C plus D, and it's also reversible here. It's in equilibrium. And this little symbol here, the arrow going forward and the arrow going backwards, means we're in equilibrium. We can write an equilibrium constant expression by taking the concentration of our products, putting them in the numerator, raising them to the power of their stoichiometric coefficient, and then dividing them by the concentrations of our reactants, with those raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficient. That's what K sub C, our equilibrium expression constant, means, or how it can be solved or found. An example of that, if we had the Haber process, we talked about this before, you know, Fritz Haber um, found a way to develop ammonia synthetically, and this helped drive World War II, or Germany for World War II, talked about this equation before. If I have this as an example, if I were going to draw or write the equilibrium expression for this, it would be K sub C equals the concentration of my products, NH3 squared, it's squared because of that coefficient of 2 there, divided by the, concept, the product of my concentrations uh, from my reactants. It's N2 and H2. H2 is cubed because of the um, circumstance coefficient here. Now, these equilibrium constants expression depend only on the stoichiometric coefficients, not the mechanism. So it doesn't matter how we got from point A to point B in our rate laws or in our expression. We don't care about the mechanism. We just care about the before and the after, the stoichiometry involved. We can also apply this to pressure. So we can apply this equilibrium constant expression to pressure. Instead of saying K sub C, we would say K sub P, because we're talking about the pressure at equilibrium. We're still going to use this format of a general reaction. A plus B goes to C plus D, and it's an equilibrium. Now, K sub P equals the pressure of my products raised to the power of their co the stoichiometric coefficients, and these will be multiplied times one another, divided by the pressures of my reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, and this is being multiplied times one another. It's the same exact thing as K sub C, except I'm not using concentrations, I'm using pressures. And with this, we can relate K sub C and K sub P. So how are they related? Well, remember the Pivner equation. So we can use Pivner when we're talking about pressures, pressures of gases. So when we're talking about K sub P, we're talking about gases in a, in a chemical reaction. So here, remember PV equals NRT. We can rearrange this and divide both sides by V and get P equals N over V times RT. N over V is referring to a certain uh, substance. Let's say substance A. Here. Why not? So P, the pressure of A, is equal to the number of moles of A over the volume of the container times RT. We know that N over V is molarity, or concentration. So this is equal to the concentration of A, this here, the concentration of A, or M for molality, MRT. 
But here I just put the concentration symbol to make it uh, simple for you. And then we plug this into the K sub P equation for each substance, meaning take this here and plug it in for A. Do the same thing for B, plug it in for B, then C, then D. And what we get as a result is this equation here. I'm not going to go through that entire derivation with you right now, but this is what we would get. So K sub P equals K sub C times RT raised to the power of delta N. And delta N is just the moles of your gaseous product. Subtract or minus the moles of your gaseous reactant. So your change in moles. Gentlemen, please take notes on this. We're going to continue with this in class. Adios.